sir. Okay, we're ready to go. Okay. Welcome uh, and good afternoon. I'm Barbara Bodine and I am the director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. And uh, we are your host this, for this afternoon's con conversation with uh, Robert Zellick, the author of the newly released August uh, America in the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. I want to thank our ISD's publication editor, Alistair Somerville, and our director of research and programs, Dr. Kelly McFarland, for all their work uh, putting this, uh, this webinar together and um, also helping with just the technical side. The, the book the book has been described as monumental, readable, literate, and witty, uh, which is high praise for a book that takes the reader on a 200 year plus drive through American history and then connects all the sights and sounds and stories to our contemporary situation. The book um, reflects extensive research and deep reflection on the lessons of that research. It's picaresque in style, um, vignettes of statesmen, and yes, all men, sorry about that, and policymakers who created and shaped our country, quite literally the shape of our country, and also shaped the values and the principles and the core interests, many and varied, um, of our policies. Bob does a splendid job of weaving, in, weaving all of this history into five traditions um, to consider as we shape our strategies going forward. And we're gonna explore those five traditions in a little bit more depth in a minute. But the five are the North American base, our friends in Canada and Mexico, trade, transnationalism, and technology, the American order, the public and congressional support, and America's purpose. What I found particularly noteworthy was a deeper theme of pragmatism rooted in vision. Statesmen and policymakers with a clear idea, a long-term vision of where they, where we, needed to go and who we needed to be, coupled with an appreciation of and a willingness to take the incremental steps to get there. These are neither visionaries untethered to the real world, nor opportunists unguided by vision. And who better to take us on this journey and to write this book than our guest today? Robert Zillick. He has been Deputy Secretary, Under Secretary, and Counselor at the Department of State, not simultaneously, Ambassador and U.S. Trade Representative, Counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury, Deputy Chief of Staff at the White House, and, by the way, President of the World Bank. Um, his experience spans six U.S. presidencies, and he is now the senior fellow at the Belfer Center of Science and International Affairs at the Kennedy School, where he is part of the Applied History Project. Also joining us today are John McNeil, university professor and professor of history at Georgetown. John has had two Fulbright Awards and fellowships with Guggenheim, MacArthur, and the Woodrow Wilson Center, and has authored um, or edited 24 books, the titles of which I will not read. He is a member of the American Art, uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences um, and a former president of both the American Society of Environmental History 
and the American Historical Society. And last, but finally not, certainly not least, is Joel Hellman, the Dean and Director, Distinguished Professor of, in the Practice at the School of Foreign Service. He is a noted scholar practitioner of political economy with degrees from Oxford and Columbia. Post-academia, he worked on pro-Soviet, post-Soviet political and economic transition and held a number of senior level positions at the World Bank in Southeast Asia, India, and led the bank's Center on Fragile and Conflict-Afflicted conflict -afflicted Countries based in Nairobi. Uh, we will, at the end of this, also share your questions with Mr. Zellick. Uh, so please use the question and answer uh, tab below at the bottom of your screen. And I know we have a number of students with us this afternoon, and I very much encourage you to ask your questions. So, Bob, um, I would like to open this conversation to um, asking you to expand on your five traditions that I outlined um, and how you wove your narrative of history together. And perhaps most importantly, um, how can and how should these shape our policies and our strategies going forward? Um, these, these five traditions were developed in an America that was very different than who we are now and a world that was very different at the time. And so how, how, do, they, how do they maintain their relevance going forward? Well, first, uh, let, let me thank you, Barbara. And uh, it's a particular pleasure to be with such an experienced uh, diplomat professor now. Um, and it's also uh, a real delight. Uh, Dean Hellman was a colleague of mine at the World Bank, uh, where he did a fantastic job with the post-conflict states. And uh, perhaps an unknown fact, but Professor McNeil and I studied together as undergraduates a long time ago. So this is a, a wonderful opportunity to be with the, the Georgetown community. So as you mentioned, um, the, the heart of the book is stories about people and episodes, because I wanted to focus on the practical experience of, of diplomacy. Um, don't, I didn't want to take anything away from a lot of the work in international relations, but my experience, and perhaps yours was the same, Barbara, that when I dealt with problems such as German unification or restarting the trade agenda or problems in Darfur, frankly, a lot of the theory wasn't too applicable. And so what I wanted to share, um, including with younger generations, with people who like reading stories about history and biography, was my insights on some of these uh, individuals and events. But as you mentioned, uh, as I looked across 200 years of history, um, I did see certain traditions that had evolved out of it. And I, uh, in, in the first one, as you mentioned, is North America, which of course, in most discussions of American foreign policy is almost always overlooked. People talk about Europe and Asia and Latin America, Mideast, maybe sometimes Africa. Uh, but rarely on the North American continent. And of course, uh, the 19th century and, and 18th century history of the United States is totally in contrast to this. Much of our foreign policy was the question of uh, the US um, domination of the continent and our relations uh, with our neighbors. Um, and of course, even in the 20th century, we almost went to war with Mexico in 1916. Uh, the infamous Zimmerman telegram where Germany says to the Mexicans, why don't you join us in war and we'll give you Texas, New Mexico, Arizona. For some reason they left out Arizona or they left out California. Um, and, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and more recent cases, so for example, in the Cold War, the great nuclear showdown uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, and during our era, um, NAFTA, which was much more than a trade agreement, it was a recognition of a transformation of, uh, of Mexico. Um, and throughout this period, the, the great benefit the United States has had with a friendship uh, and alliance with Canada. But I think equally important today, if you ask yourself what topics are the American public interested in foreign policy, there'll be subjects like immigration, uh, economic relations and interdependence, uh, uh, crime and narcotics issues, uh, environmental topics, and those are invoked very much in North America. And so if we don't have a stable North American base, we're not going to be very effective globally. 
but one can also turn that into a positive. So I came across uh, a speech that Ronald Reagan gave in 1979, launching his presidential campaign. And it's almost unbelievable today, launching a presidential campaign. Reagan says, we'd be better off with Canada and Mexico stronger rather than weaker. And it's time we stop looking at our nearest neighbors as foreigners, which is a little contrast. Oh. To this thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but the bigger picture that he wanted to focus on and that I believe is important for the future is, is that if we start to see North America as 500 million people, uh, three democracies, uh, energy uh, self-sufficiency, ability to export, better demographics than the rest of the world, um, and how, how we can use this base to actually strengthen our position around the world. So it's both historical, but also current, and I believe oriented for the future. The second trade transnationalism and technology is to try to break free from the economist notion that trade is solely about economic efficiency. If you go back to 1776 and the founding of the country, while Jefferson was working on that Declaration of Independence, Adams was part of that committee, but he chaired the committee for the first model treaty of the United States, which was basically a trade agreement. And if one recalls, this is a world of empires and mercantilism. So the first American foreign policy was a trade policy, and it was intended to try to open doors for private sector actors. So today in the academy, the world of transnational actors was a really a, an American innovation of that period. Um, and I believe that uh, whether it's a question of the future technology and free societies, this will be an important part of US ongoing presence. The third is the issue of alliances, which um, as all of the people on this call will know, for the first 150 years, America avoids them because of Washington's warning about entangling alliances and uh, uh, permanent alliances and, and Jefferson's warning about entangling alliances. So in some ways you can look at a lot of American international relations for the first 150 years as ways to interact with the world, but without being part of an alliance structure. But then in 1947-49, we have this huge historic shift. And what I partly explain is how it came about. It wasn't planned, as you know, it basically came about as a series of response to events. But it also reflected a different concept of alliances than they had been at least uh, used in the European context. And Vandenberg, who was the senator who played such a key role in this process, makes it quite clear. These relationships are to be political, economic, diplomatic. They have a military arm, but the military is actually not the first part of the relationship. And for 70 years then, much of American diplomatic history is about how do we adapt, use these alliances? What's the extent of our security commitment ranging from Berlin to Vietnam? And those are questions we very much will be facing uh, today and in the future. And then the fourth is congressional and public support. And again, this is often overlooked by, by foreign policy experts. Uh, Kennan was a brilliant thinker, but when you read his views about the Congress, I'm afraid that you can see why everybody would have kept him off the hill. And yet, uh, to be successful in the American Republic, you have to have a foreign policy grounded in public support, and that will remain important today. In fact, later this week, I see the Chicago Council on Global Affairs is releasing their most recent opinion survey. And again, it gives you a sense of where the American public is, as opposed to sometimes where some of the opinion writers think it is. And by the way, it's quite international <laughs> orientation. And then finally, um, I refer to America's purpose. And in this, I, I distinguish it from the commonly used term of exceptionalism, uh, because in early drafts of this book uh, with a seminar, uh, I came across actually an Australian army colonel who sort of bristled at the notion of just pure exceptionalism. But I did feel that from the start, the United States has had a notion of a special purpose in the world. And a wonderful anecdote that expresses this is for those who still carry wallets, Sometime look at the back of the dollar bill in your wallet and you'll see this, this great seal of the United States on the back. And maybe people have never probably studied it closely, but that seal has this unfinished pyramid which suggests that there's work to do. It's got the eye of providence above it and below it, it has Novus Ordo Seclorum, New Order of the Ages. So people are thinking in pretty big terms from the start. It's my thesis that the nature of this purpose changed. At first, it's simply to survive as a republic in the world of empires. Later, it's to preserve the union. 
then something a lot of foreign policy thinkers have, have dropped out of their assessment. It's, the, it's the, the lesson from the Union, the nature of confederations, how one interacts with other countries that comes out of the Union experience. Around 1900 with Teddy Roosevelt, that's managing a balance of power system where the United States is on the rising scene. For Woodrow Wilson, it's making the world safe for democracies. It's not making them democracies, it's making it safe for democracies. By FDR, it's the time of the four freedoms, Cold War, it's uh, leader of the free world. For President Clinton, it's America is the indispensable power. And the question we face today is how, we, how will we see our purpose in the world going forward? That's, yes. Um, and the way you wove that all together in the book, I thought was, was fascinating. I've now been in the academic world for half the time I spent in the Foreign Service. And one constant question that I've been getting from students that whole time, not just recently, is how do they square their idealism? And God save us, 20-year-old should always be idealistic, their passion for a much better world, and, and their all equal passion for, for positive change through service. How do you square that? How do they, they ask, how do you square that with concepts of pragmatism and compromise, uh, which has become a, a dirty word uh, in American vocabulary? Um, how do you square that sense of ideals, service, betterment, and this idea of loss of principles, diminishment of values, opportunism, and just plain ad hocery, or to make it simpler, how do you square holding on to your ideals and not selling out? And how did these statesmen really demonstrate pragmatism as a tool, not as an alternative? Well, uh, when Professor McNeil and I were in school, there was a man named Dahl, I think Robert Dahl, who wrote about pluralism. So at, at the American stage, uh, actually pluralism plays a role in this, is that if you're going to have people of different views in society, you have to figure out some way to reach some compromises to make a republic work. Mm -hmm. But in this book, I focus um, on pragmatism as a sense of how to try to solve problems. Mm -hmm. So for your students, I'd say it's important to get things done. Uh, good intentions are fine, uh, but they're not enough. Um, and uh, frankly, uh, to just talk about a problem uh, is not the same as trying to do something serious about the problem. And so I drew a slight connection here with pragmatism as a concept in, in American philosophy which as some of the students will know is an idea of being impatient with abstractions, intellectual conventions, dogmas, looking to uh, experience and practical consequences. And I would say, whether as a diplomat or frankly in any walk of life, whether dealing with an NGO or any, um, it's important to pay attention to the realities on the ground that you have to deal with. So for example, issues of power, economics, technology, military, votes, how to, how to get something done in a process. To understand the processes and institutions that will make the decisions. So how do they work? And how can you get something done in their context? Um, it's certainly important to know the positions of others, whether it's domestic politics or whether it's uh, foreign relations and their interests. To appreciate the role of chance and contingency and timing. And what a lot of these stories are about is the, in a sense, how people develop the judgment to try to advance a, an idea. And in a sense, I think one of the strengths of the United States is that it's tended to perform better in dynamic pluralistic environments. So you'll hear foreign policy people often talk about stability and I understand the benefit, but ironically, the United States by the nature of the system, even though it's been the greatest power, wants to continue to change and evolve the system. It wants it to, to adapt to new circumstances. And as for the question of, of principles, I guess I make a case for imperfect results in a far from perfect world. Uh, you can still do a lot of good things, whether it's uh, saving lives or peace agreements or helping improve sort of development conditions or deal with biological security or environmental issues. And I'd like to suggest that history offers insights on how to do better. 
as opposed to the acceptance of timeless obstacles, as you'll find from some historic thoughts. So yeah. it certainly doesn't dismiss the role of vision in ideas, um, but it's flexible in practical ways about how to try to achieve them. It recognizes yeah. the role of ideologies, but not rigidly. Uh, in your foreign policy experience, as well as mine, sometimes people that come in with very strong ideologies can actually drive you over a cliff if they're unaware of actually some of the practicalities uh, on the ground. Um, and it's the idea that the story of history is, is moving towards improvement and objectives towards a vision, but that it's not going to happen in, in one leap. Yeah. Um, now, I have one last question, and this is a personal question. Um, It goes to one of one of your more interesting chapters on on Lincoln and his his um, underrated but remarkable Secretary of State Seward. Um, I almost failed my Foreign Service oral exam a long time ago because of these two people. Um, I was asked after having named Lincoln as one of my favorite American presidents. Um, I was asked what I thought of his foreign policy. And I gave this a great deal of thought. And then I realized that I had no thoughts on this at all. And I finally sheepishly answered, I didn't know he had time for one. Um, what should my answer have been? Fortunately, they did not hold it against me. Well, that's a wonderful story. Um, and in a, in a small way, I, I hope that the Foreign Service oral, oral exam still asks questions like that. I'm not <laughs> sure. Um, but but if, if you read my book, you'll now be able to have a really sharp <laughs> answer with your student. So this is an example. This chapter is one I enjoyed including because so many people have read about the Civil War from battles or generals or slavery or societal effects, but very few people uh, Barbara, have, have focused on, on the foreign policy. And of course, the main objective was trying to avoid foreign intervention, how to make sure that, that Britain and France in particular didn't support the Confederacy. And keep in mind, and this is the point of context, in 1861, the Europeans really expected the South's secession to succeed. In the case of Britain, remember, you know, in the 1781, 1782, um, Cornwallis and others had marched through the southern states and dominated it, but it was too big. They couldn't control it. And they frankly thought that the North would never be able to dominate uh, the, the Confederacy. And so, and on top of that, the outgoing administration from President Buchanan, it basically suggested that secession is going to become a reality. So the first challenge for Lincoln and Seward is to issue enough of a threat to ward people off but to do it with restraint, another challenge of diplomacy. We call this brinksmanship, the threat with, with the restraint. And they encounter their first serious crisis late in 1861, when a naval captain seizes two Confederate commissioners going to Europe off a British ship. And it, it really almost created a British intervention in, in late 1861. Um, this is what led to the very practical uh, judgment of Lincoln about one war at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a wonderful little anecdote about the intervention of, of Prince Albert, who people might have seen on, on various TV programs with Victoria. Uh, he's almost two weeks away from his death of typhoid. And he suggests that they tone down the message in a way that conveys the same information, but allows the United States to save face, which Seward recognizes when he gets the letter. And Seward, as a creative lawyer, finds a message that Madison had sent when he was Secretary of State that was challenging the British position about impressing people off ships, as people will recall from the War of 1812 and similar times. And so Seward says, well, Britain has come to our position about not taking people off ships without bringing them into courts uh, for uh, court judgment. And he, he's arguing the domestic politics as, uh, as much as the international issue. But then the problem arises again in 1862 because people may recall large employment in Britain in the cotton textile industry. And a lot of the cotton came, came from the South. And so there's a movement um, a, in, in Britain to consider intervention. And this was brought to my attention in the 90s by Sir Michael Howard, who some people may know is a wonderful British military historian. And it was at a conference on uh, humanitarian intervention. And he used this example to make the case, well, what if 
Britain representing the United Nations of the day and said, this bloodletting is just terrible. We have to create some ceasefire or mediation or some process. And his message was sometimes the reality is you have to let one side win or wait for the parties to get too tired to sort of reach their own, own conclusion. Um, in the case of Britain, what the judgment they had to make was, would an intervention actually accomplish what they wanted? Would it get their result? Because they were, they frankly, the United States had made it clear that the union was not gonna be given up. Maybe the North would have invaded Canada. Uh, Britain wouldn't have gotten any more cotton uh, in the process. And then the third dimension that you could have mentioned in your, in your exam was <laughs> the wonderful case of the Emancipation Proclamation. And uh, Lincoln, uh, in part, recognizes that the, the, the international public debate has moved from union to slavery. And so uh, he believes the Emancipation Proclamation will build support in Britain. Interestingly, at first it doesn't. And this is another point of context because recall in Britain in 1857, they'd had in India what they call the Indian Mutiny. And the idea of encouraging insurrection among servile peoples as they referred to it wasn't very popular. But what is intriguing to see is in a matter of months, in part because of US public diplomacy, Lincoln starts to work the working men's and middle class associations in Britain. In fact, he writes a very famous letter to the working men of Manchester about the, the, this, their support. So you start to see the development of an Anglo-American public opinion, which obviously becomes important as the century goes along. And I guess the last point for, since you've got an international community at, at, at Georgetown, probably very few Americans have recognized that the Canadian Confederation was formed in 1867. Well, that's not an accident. That was from the North America Act of 1867. It was in part because London was worried that given the frustrations that Washington had had with Britain during the course of the Civil War, that the empowered union might march north. And so the Canadian Confederation was created of the four Eastern provinces. British Columbia was off on the West Pacific coast. Seward actually wants to bring that into the union and there's a movement to do it. I'm sad it didn't happen. Um, and, uh, and the four Eastern provinces go to British Columbia and say, what do you want to join this confederation? And they said, well, we want a transcontinental railway and we want you to help take care of some of our debts. So that also shows the consistency over time and place. Fortunately, I don't have to do a do-over do on my oral exam, but if I did, I would be able to ace it now. Thank you. Um, before I, I turn the floor over to Professor McNeil, um, I do want to remind our audience uh, to register questions in Q's and A's, and we will be getting to those. So, uh, John, I would like to turn the floor, virtually as it is, over to you at this point. Uh, great. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, here's my version of what you should have said. Lincoln <laughs> allowed the Union Army to win the war by keeping Britain and France out. One sentence, full marks. <laughs> uh, Bob, great to see you again. I'm going to ask you a, a few questions about the book as a whole and, and writing a history book. And my first one is about your intended audience. In some ways, the book uh, has uh, powerful components of traditional uh, diplomatic history in it, as if your intended audience was uh, Jim Field or James Field Jr., one of your teachers and one of my teachers. But a moment ago, you said you're also trying to uh, reach young people who might be interested in foreign policy. So every time you write a book, you have in the back of your mind, if not the front of your mind, an intended imagined audience. What, what is yours? That's a wonderful question. And uh, I had that advice as I started writing. You've written many books. This is my, uh, my first and perhaps only. And the advice was to keep in mind uh, who your audience would be. So I, I had a few groups. One, um, I wanted to make this a book that would appeal to a general informed audience, readers of Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and particular people who might pick up a biography or enjoy uh, American history. And so um, I tried to 
select both figures and uh, the sort of the color in the stories to hold their uh, attention and interest. But second, um, uh, as you noticed, I, I wanted it to try to clear the bar with serious historians such as yourself to say, well, there's been serious research here. If you look, there's about 50 pages of notes uh, for people who want to use this in a university audience. There's a lot that you, they can mine in those notes about other sources. I relied on the work of a lot of great historians, but I also did some primary research myself and I had a wonderful PhD history student at Harvard um, who, who helped me. But then I also, uh, as, as my conversation with Barbara suggested, I wanted to try to reach out to people who are interested in the broader subject of foreign policy making. They may be diplomats, they may be in civil society groups, uh, they could be in environmental groups, to help them sort of understand the practical realities of policy making as I experienced it. And then, in a sense, use these almost as case studies to sort of ask, well, what would I have done in such a situation? And I've been uh, pleasantly pleased since I published the book, I've had a former Canadian diplomat and a current Australian diplomat that said they want to try to use the book as part of their education process uh, with their foreign service institutes. And I'm trying to reach out to the United States one as well. And then the last one, and this is, I haven't mentioned this to anybody, but uh, Mitch Daniels, who is a good friend of mine, now president of Purdue, had been governor of Indiana, at one point was considering a presidential run. And when he and I were having a dinner out in Indiana at the time, uh, I was asking him what he was reading. And he told me he was reading Henry Kissinger's Diplomacy. And I thought, well, I'd actually like to write something that would help the future uh, Mitch Daniels of the world think about uh, the American experience as they think about foreign policy. That's a lot of different audiences rolled into one. Um, and I, I hope you reach them. So a moment ago, you, you mentioned um, a selection of uh, case studies, for want of a better term. By my count, 17 out of your 18 chapters are in effect case studies about certain episodes and usually about one specific American diplomat. How did you choose the 17 that you chose? And in some instances, if I may say so, these are eccentric choices. Because for example, you've got uh, Vannevar Bush with uh, a, a chapter, and he's not normally understood as a diplomat, as a, sort of a, a science czar. Um, and then there's some crucial decisions in American foreign policy history that aren't there. And from my point of view, the biggest example of that was the choice to go to war with Mexico of uh, President Polk. You have a chapter on Wilson's choice to go to war in 1916, but the Mexican-American War is at least as consequential for American history and that decision isn't in the book. So how did you choose what goes in and what is left out? So that's another wonderful question. So I, I wanted to cover uh, the full range of time periods. And in particular, when I've talked with uh, some of my colleagues in the US government or even at the World Bank, I noticed those that had learned something about diplomatic history really had it goes from about World War II on. So I particularly wanted to cover some of the first 150 years where I think there were some interesting ideas and, and, uh, and, and incidents. Um, I also wanted to cover types of issues in diplomacy. So you'll find there's mediation, there's how do you uh, avoid wars, how do you get out of wars, uh, there's trade, there's international law. I'm trying to cover different subject matters uh, at the same time at a different time period. I'm trying to cover different regions. And if anything, I wanted to, if I'd had another chapter or two, I would have tried to do a little bit more on the Middle East, which, which shows up a little bit in the process, but, but not as much. Um, and then of course, you're selecting leaders that represent uh, sort of different perspectives. So my first 
chapter after the introduction is about Hamilton. And that's not accidental because that's a Secretary of the Treasury as opposed to a Secretary of State because I wanted to emphasize uh, the economic dimensions. I don't know if this ever happened to any of your books, but I did start to run into a length issue. So <laughs> with my publisher, um, I was way over the wordage. And so what you'll, what you'll be interested in a little bit is, is some of the ones you mentioned. Um, I included Ben Eberbush because I think most examinations of foreign policy will look at geopolitics. Increasingly, they look at economics. Very few look at science and technology. And as an environmental historian, I would figure you would be sensitive to this one. And so I, I wanted to try to, number one, introduce a, a figure who I think was important in World War II, not as well understood and critically important in the shaping of America's science and technology policy after World War II, which I think um, is quite fundamental to the United States' success in the Cold War. I talk about the development of the triple helix concept and basic research and the role of universities and the private sector. But as you look closely at the chapter, you also see that I discuss the international dimensions of this, which I think is important for people thinking about negotiations on climate change or pandemics and biological security. It so happened I was the, the lead for the United States government in the only global climate change treaty that's ever passed the Senate, ratified the Senate, the Framework Accord of 92, which still actually is the framework for the Paris Accord and, and all the others. And I wanted to plant the seed of people's thinking that as you think about future competition with China, I think science and technology policy will be, be very important. Now you mentioned Polk, and that was quite amusing, interesting to me because I really wanted to include Polk, but a different aspect of Polk than you did. I wanted to include the difference between Nicholas Trist, his negotiator in Mexico City, and Polk in ending the war, because I thought there was a very interesting example there I'm not sure it would happen in today's modern communications about a difference between a negotiator and, and the, the president about the decision to end the war. And I would have used that to talk a little bit about sort of the fundamental poke decisions about what the war uh, was about. But there's some others. And again, one of the other factors, John, is that you know I, I had to take account of what I thought were relatively recent good accounts on incidents where I didn't think I was going to add as much. So Phil Zelico, for example, did a very good piece. I think it was uh, in the Texas National Security Review about uh, the decision of the United States to take over the Philippines in 1899 and 1900. I wasn't going to add much to what Phil wrote on that. There are other areas like Vietnam where people have done, like Fred Logoval, excellent work but it was just too important to leave out. And so I focused on a particular decision process and you'll see in that, that chapter, I probably add more of my assessment as a policymaker with the six factors of things that, that I went wrong. I would have liked to include a chapter on Eisenhower and, uh, and frankly, the Solarium Project, which is a way to try to look at the Cold War in a strategic sense. Um, I went back and forth about trying to include uh, Jimmy Carter because I either wanted to include his human rights issue or his negotiation uh, with Egypt and Israel. Uh, but again, Stu Eisenstadt's relatively recent book on Carter has a wonderful chapter <laughs> on that. So, you know, these, these are always uh, questions of judgment. And I guess I was hoping that if this idea that I have been encouraged in this book catches on, well, maybe people will do other chapters. Well, we'll see. I, uh, I, still, I, I think the Mexican War falls into the same category as the Vietnam War. Two important to leave out. So let me ask you one more question before I turn the floor over to Joel Hellman, who I think is going to carry the discussion into the present moment and the future. One of the interesting features of your book is that the chapters include rather rich biographical background information on the key figures. And that allows the reader to know something about the formative experiences of, of the key players in your narrative. And it got me wondering if there is any ideal background for a top diplomat in the US. So I noticed, for example, that several of them had long experience of Congress. 
um, like Henry Clay or Cordell Hall or LBJ, but others, Reagan, for example, had never set foot there before they became, uh, in effect, uh, leaders of American diplomacy. Does congressional background help? Does it hurt? Are there other aspects of biographical background that contribute to making an effective or, on the other hand, an ineffective diplomat within the American context? Well, you'll like uh, the first part of my answer is I think having a strong sense of history is a wonderful background to have, uh, not only of your own country, but of others. So uh, when, when I was in college, uh, I don't know how you did this, but I had done a lot of US and European history. So I actually took courses also on African history and Latin American history and Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, <laughs> and later I filled in Asian. And that was a great help to me in my international work because I at least knew enough to ask questions. And particularly for Americans around the world, where foreigners often feel we don't know much about their past, it gave me a real advantage. So, and it's also very helpful going back to my point about pragmatism to have a sense of how others have, have seen their history and approach problems. Um, the nature of the book is about problem solvers. So that's another important uh, approach. Uh, I tend to feel that multidisciplinary skills are useful in, in, in problem solving. And I have come to the view that uh, history is most helpful in thinking of questions to ask. Most people think of history in the form of analogies. And I think analogies often mislead as much as they help, but it's a common device that's used. And so um, Ernest May and uh, Neustadt wrote a book about thinking in time uh, a number of decades ago, and they focused on this method of asking questions. And frankly, as I think, as I read accounts and I try to think about what I would do, it's, it's sort of the approach that I would take. Um, I suppose another tendency that you see me discuss is uh, a certain sense of activism, people who want to get things done. They're not just commentators, they're not just analysts, um, but also with some sense of, of discipline. So my chapter on JFK is also cautionary about sort of activism uh, without uh, sort of recognizing some of the limits. And in fact, part of diplomacy is when to say no and, and one, when not to move on topics. I've often felt, John, that in many uh, sort of aspects of, of sort of executive service, the ability to connect dots, that might be another multidisciplinary, but the, the ability to see interconnections across issues, again, whether they be votes, technology, political power, um, and it certainly helps to have a feel for politics in your country and others. So when you ask about members of Congress, as you'll see in my chapter on LBJ, I think his service as a majority leader actually hurt him as a president, um, where actually JFK, in part with Eisenhower's coaching, and Eisenhower had a heck of experience before he took the job, sort of learns how a president uh, needs to get his or her advisors debating in front of them, but, but while maintaining control over the situation. JFK is wonderful in that I think he makes a lot of early mistakes, but he shows the ability to learn, and he's, he's, he, he learns a heck of a lot in his time period. And I guess the last thing I would say is um, the importance of ability to build trust and bring others along. So, um, you know, some of the people on this call may be reading John Bolton's book. <laughs> well, you'll see there's a slightly different style that John evidences than what Ben Franklin and Alexander Hamilton talk about, where they make this wonderful observation that uh, small gestures can often have a big effect with important people and, and events. And so, uh, figuring out how to how to connect with people emotionally as well as rationally, I think, is another skill. Bob, I'd love to ask you whether your admiration for Hamilton extends to his trade policy, but instead, I'm going to turn it over to Dean Joel Hellman. Well, Thank actually, you. Look, do, do two seconds on trade policy because I I know you had an interest in that. It, it's a long book; you might not have gotten to this, but in the in the traditions chapter, I talk about Hamilton's trade policy. And, it's a, and, and your question gives me an opportunity to kind of raise the important fact that, you know, Hamilton is often cited as kind of an early form of protectionist. And he really isn't. He, number one, 90% of the American revenues come from customs. 
if we had blocked trade, we wouldn't have been able to, to pay the debt and, or, or the government. And so he does talk about encouraging the domestic manufacturing industry. But the work of, of Doug Irwin at, at, uh, at, at Dartmouth or a fellow named Claude uh, Clarfield sort of emphasizes he actually preferred bounties. And his logic was, as mine would be today, uh, tariffs tend to protect inefficient industries. In his era, they also encouraged uh, smuggling. Um, and uh, they end up in creating additional costs for, for, for users. So it's interesting, over the years, Hamilton has been used with the infant industry argument to defend protectionism. I don't think his record justifies that, and other trade historians would agree with me. Well, look, thank you very much, John. And um, uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you, Bob. I, I have to say that I had a lot of personal experience with your approach to pragmatism um, in dealing with some of the most complex problems of the world. When you were faced with, how's the World Bank going to deal with fragile and conflict-affected states? I recall very clearly that rather than do another grand strategy, another corporate approach, you said, let's get a group of people, let's put them out in the field. Um, and you sent me and a group of uh, dedicated people out to Nairobi, and you said, try things, be pragmatic, see what works, you're gonna fail a lot, it's a really complex set of issues. Um, but try through that pragmatism to figure a way forward and we'll, you know, we'll keep returning to it. And it was a kind of wonderful way. I, I, I teach a course on fragile and conflict-affected states now. And I have to say the pathway is littered with grand corporate strategies that had very little impact on how we approach those issues. Whereas your approach is saying, let's figure out how to provide some, you know, little by little <laughs> incremental approaches. You once described yourself to me as a radical incrementalist. Um, uh, was, I think, a, a great way of doing it. But I want to take you to the, to the current moment and to the future in particular. Um, look, your, your diplomatic traditions have never been um, more seriously tested than at the current moment. And you made reference earlier to the fact that the Chicago Values Survey suggests that the significant part of the American population is still quite internationalist um, and still probably, you know, would, would look very favorably on your core diplomatic um, traditions. Yet, we are in this position um, in which um, the current administration um, has deeply questioned almost every one of your key diplomatic traditions and your own writings in the journal and elsewhere have sort of suggested it. Sort of, I really have two kind of questions. Um, what happened? What, where, what, what led to this deep, um, essentially questioning, if not a, a full blown change in popular attitudes, um, but certainly um, at the elite level and in the Republican Party and with support um, from various aspects of the Republican Party that surprised many of us, um, uh, which we thought were much more core, those values core to the Republican Party. As someone who's been involved in the Republican Party and thinking about the foreign policy and economic policy of the party, you know, what led to this kind of deep questioning and deep challenging and, and, and most importantly, how do, you, how do you rethink what that's going to look like, um, uh, perhaps after the next election? So uh, on the first part, um, I think that, um, you know, you're, you're going to have political analysts sort of uh, work their way through the data for a long time. So let's say these are working hypotheses. Um, one, I think the, the shocks of the of the, of the financial crisis and the long recovery uh, made people anxious. Um, I think that the long wars left people feeling dissatisfied. Uh, my own personal view, and most of the political analysts that I've come across seem to share this view, is that there, there was an underlying sense of identity more than economics. I mean, so for example, you would see Trump voters that might be uh, kind of in the same economic conditions as African Americans or Hispanics that wouldn't vote for Trump, but they became the core basis of his support. I do think some of this was uh, related to um, the, the pace of illegal immigration. Um, I, I noticed this in, in European countries. I remember talking to a Swedish politician and said, said you know, uh, the communities that, that had rapid influx of immigrants and so, people who felt that their kids were in schools and people were no longer speaking Swedish or in the Midwest in English or others. I think there's a sense of dislocation. And I think what, what Trump picked up on was his, his, his foreign policy in a sense is a derivative of his role as an outsider 
in his role as a disruptor. And that's what appealed politically, and that's how he carried forward his foreign policy. So, so take the wall with Mexico. I always felt that this was a core issue for him and his supporters. So in a sense, he could never really solve the issue. And, and when Congress no longer funded it, he would take money out of the Defense Department because he couldn't be seen as, as seeding that issue. Well, trade protection is another one that's a close second in terms of his sort of view of, of uh, sort of uh, America being taken advantage of. Um, and then there's some very personal aspects. I mean, I think he, he, wanting to represent a break with the past, you'll notice whether Republicans or Democrats, he, he in a sense wants to do the opposite of what they do. So if they didn't see the North Korean leadership, he will. If they do the deal, Obama does with the deal with Iran, he sort of wants to get rid of it. Um, and so that goes to your, your question, your, uh, so the question about the future. And I don't sort of mean just to uh, say that, you know, the, use the general excuse of leadership, but leadership does matter. I mean, so going back to John's trade question, um, I said a little story in my book from 1947, which I included because you'll hear many people today say, well, the United States was dominant mid 20th century, it could afford to be gracious on trade issues. Well, this was Will Clayton, uh, who was negotiating the GATT agreement at first with 22 other countries, um, trying to create a new trading system after World War II. And the Congress passes a 50% wool tariff. And Australia says, well, if we have a 50% wool tariff, we're pulling out of this deal. And Britain says, well, as a leader of Commonwealth, we'll have to go too. And if Britain goes, Europe doesn't see much uh, of interest in the potential trade negotiation. So Clayton goes all the way back to, to see Truman. Truman gives him 15 minutes and the Secretary of Agriculture 15 minutes. And I've been in a lot of meetings like this. The Secretary of Agriculture said, you know, if you don't sign that world tariff bill, you'll lose up to seven states in the 48 election. And Clayton makes the case for an international economic order and recovery. Truman vetoes the bill, gives Clayton the authority to do a 25% tariff cut, and I should remind people, wins the 1948 election. <laughs> so so to, to bring it back to these traditions, um, look, my point on North America is interesting. If you think about the press today, one of the issues for, for former Vice President Biden is his support among Hispanic or Latino voters. Well, frankly, I one of my arguments about North America is I think you can also use this as a way to strengthening your position, not only with immigration, but uh, with uh, those voters, including in the southwestern states. So I think this could be good politics as well. Um, in, in a way, you know, the recent renegotiation of NAFTA to the US uh, MCA was revealing because Trump wanted to kill the agreement. And frankly, uh, President Lopez Obrador in Mexico probably didn't love it so much. But after 25 years, it was so solid in the, in the three economies, they couldn't sort of uh, do away with it. But uh, if we take the trade transnationalism and technology topics, well, as this Chicago Council survey will show, a lot of Americans, particularly younger Americans, are concerned about environmental issues. They're concerned about biological security issues. Those are classic transnational issues you're not gonna be able to deal with just within sort of national borders. Um, the support for alliances, by the way, is in the 70%. I and mean, so it's a question of, you know, how do we retool them and how do we readapt them for different circumstances? And it's not only a president's job. So one of the things that I try to draw out in this book is the role of somebody like Vandenberg in the 47, 49 period. And there's actually the methods he uses with Congress are quite interesting. But if you think of more modern era, you know, the role that a Senator McCain played helping President Clinton or people like Nunn or Luger. And so one of the questions will be, you know, who will step up into those roles going uh, forward? And on the positive side, what's interesting is in the recent House elections, you've seen a lot of members of both parties who had international experience, either military intelligence or sometimes economic areas. So there may be a group to work with there that could be, be quite positive. And then the last point, really coming back to the, the tradition of about America's purpose in the world, I think Americans don't want to be taken advantage of, but I don't think, I, I think Trump's sort of a narrow idea of America first being America alone won't play that well over time, but that's for voters to decide. Look, I, I just briefly want to ask you about the Republican Party itself, because I mean, I think that 
the difference in the gap between, I think, some traditional Republican Party values that you very much reflect and are reflected um, in your book, and some of the dynamics that Trump took, used his leadership um, to stoke, if you will, in the public. Um, how does that kind of, how do you put that kind of back together again within the Republican Party? Is there a gap there that is going to kind of, I think, continue even um, after Trump leaves? Or is it, is it a gap that could narrow very quickly, given what you sort of say about um, broader public uh, values? I think, Joe, we're actually going to be in transitional periods for both parties, but I'll come back to the Democratic in a moment. Um, in, you know, there tends to be a lesson in the American political system, which is if you lose and lose badly, uh, you have to readjust. <laughs> and so we'll see you know, whether people recognize that if you try to rely on heavy turnout from a shrinking demographic, you know, whether that's a formula for success. Um, the Republican Party before Trump was actually trying to reach out to Hispanics and sort of broaden the inclusive base. So that will be kind of uh, one lesson. Uh, second, you know, it depends, of course, if Trump is reelected or if, if he isn't reelected, what, how does he position himself? Um, and, you know, that's a big question mark uh, with because he's clearly brought along the base of the party. And I think even members of Congress that might not have been fully comfortable with some of his positions felt that they had to accommodate uh, the base of the party. Uh, the other reality is, is that it will depend on, on uh, kind of the competition among uh, leaders. Uh, there's some in the Senate, but traditionally you often find governors that have to deal with the practical process of governing. So this will be a battle. My, my own sense is, is that um, you won't go back to the past. Um, and it's, it's a really going to be, and I hope actually, if Trump doesn't win, that the easiest thing for an opposition party and minority to do is just oppose. And, uh, and, and frankly, that's happened across both parties. I think that would be a shame. I think that there's an importance about battling of ideas. And you know, it's one of the reasons, you know, while I'm a distinct minority on many issues, I keep arguing about some of these points because I think over the long run, um, there's saliency to the argument. Now on the Democratic side, um, you know, keep in mind, uh, if Biden wins, this is gonna be quite interesting <laughs> because, um, you know, given his age, the normal interagency battles will not only be over policy, they're gonna be over the future of the Democratic Party. And um, if, you, if you look at the Carter administration, Clinton and Obama, you have Democratic presidents that came in after Republicans with actually Democratic Congresses. And one of the big challenges they had was managing expectations um, and, uh, and, and trying to decide on sort of what priorities. And if you recall in all three of those cases, in the midterm elections, they suffered serious reverses. So I think one of the challenges, if Biden's elected, will be to have, uh, watch closely who the chief of staff is and who the, the national security advisor is, because you'll need to have discipline on these issues. Remember, when, when James Baker, my former boss, was chief of staff to Reagan, um, he, he said to Reagan, you've got three priorities in 1981, economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic recovery. Well, I think one of the challenges for uh, President Biden will be, he's got a huge agenda. You know, he's got the pandemic and trade healthcare system, immigration and racism, economic uh, sort of recovery, environmental issues. How will you sequence those? And I think from the international side, and I wrote a piece recently about this in Foreign Affairs Online, I think there's ways you could leverage that domestic agenda into an international agenda and frankly use it to rebuild your alliances and then face the two bigger questions. China and the future of free societies. Great, thanks. Let me turn it over to Barbara now and try to get some of the questions in, which I'm sure there are plenty. Okay. From the audience. Yes, we've, and we've got great questions. Um, I'll try to conflate, uh, conflate them without distorting them. You've actually kind of given me a segue in, into the first one, first two. Uh, first, if, if you were to be elected president in January, um, what would be your top three priorities to get us back on track? You've talked about this a little bit, but the other more nuanced part of that is you've talked about pragmatic idealism. You've talked about public and congressional support. How would a political leader, how do they educate uh, the public and Congress 
to accept this more nuanced incremental approach to uh to policy issues um we tend to like the big dramatic and um what comes through in your book and what comes through and what you said is this quieter more incremental step by step and and real world is is going to be more effective in the long term but it doesn't have the drama so what would be your three priorities and then how would you bring the public and congress along for your pragmatic idealism approach well as you suggest or you know one of the key things is you, from the, that I started with is it helps to accomplish things. <laughs> success breeds success, right? And so some of these can be small, some of these can build. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I would take uh, some of the core issues I mentioned to Joel and make both the domestic and international. So, so take the pandemic. The pandemic obviously is the priority issue and related to it is the economic topics. Um, I hope we'll have a vaccine by that time, but we're going to also learn a lot about the nature of the treatments that are done and kind of uh, how to deal with this as sort of an ongoing threat. Um, but I would also connect an international dimension of this. So frankly, I would do more than just rejoin the WHO. I try to deal with some of the WHO's problems. And I look back, for example, at what Bush 43 did with the HIV AIDS initiative and malaria and tuberculosis, and whether we do it with others, what sort of role we play, that can be flexible. But this is a great opportunity to not only deal with the fundamentals of a pandemic, which won't go away unless you deal with, with it uh, globally. And particularly, I'm quite concerned about the developing world. It's another topic. I think we could face a, a decade of stagnation here. Um, but then on top of it, sort of demonstrate some of the US capabilities, not only with vaccine development, but a lot of this will be the distribution system and the cold uh, uh, sort of storage yeah. system and others. And then similarly, if you take something like uh, 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 immigration, you know, if you do something with, um, with Dreamers, then connect it with your North America policy. You know, so use this to kind of rebuild the North American concept that I talked about. And frankly, I think if we change our visa policy and have a different attitude towards legal immigration, um, that's not so bad for our economy either. In fact, it's quite good for our economy. Um, the Democratic Party also faces trade protectionism, but I think you know we could start to roll back some of the tariffs, for example, with Canada and Mexico and others. And, and this is again where the multilateral instinct that you hear from Biden needs to be put into practice. You could do some things, for example, with China in institutions like the IMF and World Bank that would be face saving for all the parties, but allow us to help developing countries and help sort of a more robust uh, sort of global economy. And there are other issues that I don't think you could ignore related to environment and, and climate change. But I think on those issues, again, rather than just rejoin the Paris Accord, I'm, I'm a big believer in trying to build a coalition with the developing world. So take an initiative such as soil carbon for sub-Saharan Africa, which could do a lot for African agriculture and also sort of build your political coalition or forestation and avoided forestation. So actually on the positive side, there's lots of opportunities out there. The question is, you know, can you connect the domestic with the international? Yeah. And the types of things I've talked about, you, you, can, you can do two things. One is you can show you can get things done, which I think the American people will want to feel. Um, and then second, you can show how the United States can focus on things at home, but also play a leadership role. And I think American people, going back to Joel's question, would like to see that combination. Yeah. Um, you've, you've brought up China a couple of times. Uh, and China figures prominently in your book as well. Um, I grew up in California. We always thought of Asia as the far west, not the far east. Uh, and I think a lot of American policy has also kind of tended to look towards China. Um, how would you, how would you manage China? Uh, and that's both how, where we are bumping up against China in Africa, which you've mentioned a couple of times. Um, the idea that China could be a stakeholder, but it's not at all clear that President Xi actually wants to do that. Um, how do we manage the, the, the China question? 
So this is a big one. <laughs> yes. Um, it, it was and, about four questions. Very. Yeah, I, I, I can see your, your yeah. effort. Um, so in some ways, it builds off the question we just answered. This is a long-term competition with China, um, and it starts at home. So frankly, the more we uh, succeed as a society, the more we're with education, our economy, innovation, um, I frankly believe, going back to the Van Ever Bush story, that uh, the ability to have a society that encourages liberty and mavericks and innovation, uh, as well as helping a free society is gonna be more successful over the long run. And so I think one of America's greatest strengths traditionally has been its openness to people, ideas, goods, you know, trade, capital. So we certainly don't want to go to the path of trying to uh, restrict ourselves. Then secondly, building on my concept of allies and partnerships, um, I think the United States can be much more effective dealing with the challenge of China uh, if, if we work with the traditional allies in some, some countries that I don't think are going to be allies, but they will become partners like India. India wants to have its own strategic autonomy, but sort of can play a role in this. Um, and third, uh, in, in security terms, I, I think, you know, we need to work with those allies to have a strategy that is more like Mahan in terms of a Pacific perimeter. And, and in particular, we probably will need to move away from big aircraft carriers and have more of an anti-access area denial strategy with sort of submersible sort of uh, networked equipment. There have been some books written about this recently. Um, then on the, on the economic side, where I differ from some of the new confrontationalists is uh, th there's a conventional wisdom that has crept in that cooperation with China failed. And I wrote a piece in, the, Nas in uh, the National Interest in March and April for those interested in it, where I gave a long list of things that has served America's interests with China. And it doesn't mean to, uh, on economic security, environment, you know, UN Security Council, even Taiwan. Um, and my point is not that all is well, but if you, if you work from the false assumption that you can't cooperate with China, I think you're gonna put yourself into a corner. And so you have to ask yourself if you wanna deal with future biological security issues or climate issues or economics, how are you gonna do it without China? And I believe that there are many still possibilities for win-win solutions. I mean, if you, if you step back and look at the Trump approach, he raised a bunch of tariffs, he focused on a bilateral trade deal, it basically is not, it's only being halfway sort of uh, completed. And our trade deficit is the same as when he started, which was a stupid measure to start out with. In, this goes to the, the practical terms. Take an area like intellectual property rights. China has now created intellectual property rights courts where foreigners win about 85 to 90 percent of the cases. But the penalties aren't high enough, so negotiate higher penalties. We have a problem with forced technology transfer, which is prohibited by their WTO accession. The problem is getting the evidence. And most likely the joint venture requirements that China has creates the temptation. So work with China to remove a lot of the joint venture requirements. And these are the types of things you could do with other partners. And frankly, you can do with some forces within China. Now, having said this, I think it's also important to recognize that Xi has changed Chinese policy. And my favorite example is when he took office in 2012, he created a documentary film about the end of the Soviet Union. So for the students on this call, that's a historical event. For him, it's, it's the concern that what happened in the Soviet Union could happen in China. And the story of this documentary film is, look how Gorbachev abandoned the Communist Party, killed his country, and it's not gonna happen here. So one needs to understand that's part of his, his mental time, his set of reference point. And so when it comes back to issues like values and freedom, I think you can work with China, you can work with allies, but you don't have to see that aspirational point. And as a good practical example, rather than sanction leaders in Hong Kong, I would do what Britain did and say, let's offer people from Hong Kong to come to the United States. That's a good way of expressing the difference between the two societies. So the, my point with China is at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what is it you want to accomplish? It goes back to this notion of results. And do you think Trump has accomplished that? Most of the studies, the the set of articles that I see said, oh, great, we now stand up to them. Well, so, you know, I can get in fights with people and stand up, and what does that accomplish for me? So I'm a little realistic about saying, let's focus on what we want to do. And I hope that um, 
in the current environment, which I think is increasingly dangerous, the starting point would be to find some off ramps and start to build on some of this cooperation. Yeah, can I sort of play off of that? Because you've, you've talked about working with our allies and, and friends um, and I think working with them on the off ramps and, and how do you build a realistic cooperation, not a naive cooperation, um, is a better alternative than going to war. Um, how, talk about the difference between how we approach these issues or even how we approach diplomacy and how Europeans go about it. You know, because we've had some major differences in approach to some critical areas around the world. The JCPOA being one, you've mentioned our response on Hong Kong. Um, do we just see the world differently than the Europeans? Do we engage differently? Um, how strong them? Uh, how do we work with our allies? There is no doubt a different historical perspective. Um, you know, so as you know, I worked a lot with Germany. I negotiated uh, German unification in 8990. The historical experience of Germany is different than the United States. So they're, they're gonna, whether it's military power or whether it's their position in Europe, they're gonna bring different perceptions. Um, I think that, uh, and Kissinger made a point to me actually a number of months ago that I think is, he still has wonderful insights, is that while working with alliance partners can often be trying and you often have to sort of reach accommodations. At the end of the day, they probably bring in perspectives that are important for you to, uh, to at least recognize, even if you don't fully accept. And again, my, my chapter on Baker and Bush in, uh, in 8990 is a classic of sort of alliance management that worked successfully, but took account, for example, of the anxieties in Germany over short range missiles and, and uh, the appeal of Gorbachev. But to connect it to uh, this discussion more particularly, this, little, this idea that I've mentioned about leveraging the domestic policy with your international policy, I think could actually be very important in rebuilding relations with allies. So if we think about pandemic issues, economic growth issues, uh, inclusive economic growth issues, uh, migration issues, climate issues, that is actually a pretty good agenda <laughs> to work with Europe on but then of course, to also face some of the security questions of regional hegemons and weapons of mass destruction, um, China, free societies. But I could see that in some ways that would be a more modern security agenda with allies upon which you build some of the other items. Um, and so it's not a question of whether Germany contributes 2% to NATO, I wish they did, but that's not the key defining uh, issue going forward. So a lot of what these go back to, and your career was built around this and to a degree mine as well, is that you know, the United States is most effective when it works with other partners, when we can leverage other players in the system. And you know, as, as Kissinger also says, you know, only in fantasy negotiations do you get exactly all of what you want. <laughs> Yes, and I have never seen those ever happen. Um, one last question, because we have sort of kept you, kept you a little long and kept everybody a little long. Um, why did you end with George H.W. Bush? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, I, 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 I didn't want to write a book that was about a current commentary on world affairs. I write those in sort of other contexts. I wanted it to be treated as a serious history and look. And my own sense was that after that, that Bush 41, George H.W. Uh, Bush, is sort of passing into history. Mm -hmm. Clinton, uh, Bush 43, Obama, those are still in the partisan political context. Um, okay. and particularly because I was involved with those issues, you know, as a policymaker, sometimes in campaigns. Uh, inevitably, it would have been tilted or colored, whatever I said. However, I had a seminar up at Harvard of, of faculty and graduate students. They said, you can't end with Bush. Uh, so um, as you will see in the book, I wrote an afterword where I took the five traditions and tried to apply it to uh, uh, Clinton, Bush 43, Obama, and a bit of Trump. Um, and I'm sure I would have sold more books if I'd put Trump in the title, if I looked at what's on them. So, but I didn't want to make this just a Trump book. <laughs> Um, uh, 
what I found interesting, Barbara, was you, this is where you could see these people passing into history. Uh, when you look at Bush 41, Clinton and Bush 43, while there are differences, there's actually a lot of similarities across the three of them. And, uh, and of course, the, the double irony is that Bush 41, who's the first term president, actually sets the foundation stones for a lot of them in terms of Middle East peace process, dealing with China, NAFTA, Uruguay around creation of the WTO, um, the only climate change accord. And so this one term president creates the framework for the, the, yeah. uh, the other two. I, I see a little bit with Obama. And again, I worked quite well with Obama when I was at the World Bank. And I have a little story about my interaction with him at his first international meeting in the book. But I think Obama is partly reflecting this, this tide in events that Joel was asking about. And it's a little bit of a withdrawal. And of course, Trump then represents a very sharp reversal. So we're in the period where I hoped that some of the traditions and experience in the book would help people think through how do we reestablish our foreign policy for the future. Yeah. Um, yeah, unfortunately for, for us, um, George, uh, 41 has has very much faded into history um you know one of the uh, one of one of the realities of, of working in the academic world is is realizing how much of your own history that you think is current is <laughs> history to the people you're talking to um and so i think you know bringing that forward in your book um and 41 and what he's what he what he accomplished um, was probably as good a place to stop as, as, as any. Well, thank you, Barbara. And um, so I think also talking about a good place to stop, um, we could probably keep this conversation going for a very long time because there is so much richness, both in history and how it applies currently and what we're all facing. Um, but you've been very patient with us. You've been very generous with us. Um, you have reminded everyone that you know history is not history it's you know the past isn't dead it's not even really past as the man said uh and i can't thank you enough uh for providing this book and for providing this time sharing with it uh sharing all of it with us today um it's been a great afternoon well thank you for hosting me appreciate it and, and good luck with your students oh yeah um i got good kids um, thank you all. Um, we will see you at our next ISD event. Uh, Joel, uh, if you're still with us, thank you again for being part of this. And again, to my absolutely fantastic staff um, who made all of this happen. So, as the man said, good night and good luck. Thank you. Bye.